I'm kind of the the yes man in our relationship. Dean's kind of the no the no man in the relationship. Um, we were very well balanced in our uh, the ways that we approach things. I'm a risk taker. He's not so much. I, I to this day, I'm actually still really shocked that he was willing to take our nest egg and go all in in this business. Like sometimes I think to myself, like we were kind of crazy and you, you almost have to, if you're going to do something and you're going to go all in, you almost have to not know what's ahead of you. Cause if you know, like I'm in my late thirties now and if I had started the business now, I don't know that I'd actually start it. Cause I know now the work that goes into it. Welcome to Making It in Asheville, a podcast where you get to hear stories behind some of your favorite artists and businesses in town. Each episode, we interview a local Ashevillian. We work to uncover how they're making it in Asheville and provide you with actionable insights from each conversation. And we're your hosts. That was Sarah and I'm Tony, and we are a husband and wife team that moved to Asheville in May of 2019. Since then, we've set out to answer a single question, and that is, how does one make it in Asheville? And with that, we started this podcast. And this podcast is powered by our very own marketing agency called Making It Creative. We help passionate business owners develop meaningful storytelling and messaging, as well as marketing strategies to grow and more effectively convert their audience. Into customers. And that is a uh, key underlinable statement there is that we are working to, to close sales and grow businesses all while doing storytelling and marketing things. Uh, another business in town that is doing some really compelling work to help grow businesses, either from inception to um, like a rebrand 10 years into their business is Atlas Branding. And that's who we sat down and interviewed in this episode. Lisa and Dean are the founders and creators of Atlas Branding. It's about a little over a 10 year old business. Yeah, they've been here, I think, since 2008. Um, so they've had their foot here in Asheville for quite a long time. And we kind of get to uncover a lot of the stories from that experience. Yeah. And Dean grew up in the area and there's the family local. So like Asheville was a place that called them. Um, their story of starting the business uh, is interesting in so much as like they weren't confident at least at the outset, that the timing was perfect. They were hoping for things to be different. Dean did not have a passion for branding or creative in that way, um, but he, he develops it over time, and that's one of our favorite parts of this episode. For sure, yeah. Um, and another part that I really loved was the fact that this was one of the first this was the first married couple that we interviewed that works together. Um, so that really spoke very closely to us because we are married and we work together and we spend all day together. And so they shared with us some tips for finding better ways to work together. Mm -hmm. Two pieces of advice yeah. uh, in you'll particular. Have to, you'll have to listen to hear what those two are. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, so yeah, I think it was very relatable for us because A, they are in marketing, a different aspect of marketing than what we do, but they are in the marketing field. They're growing their own business much like ourselves mm -hmm. and they're married. So it was very, it, it struck a special chord for, for me. For sure, for sure. And there's, um, there's a certain level. Uh, we got to talk to Dean after the interview and Lisa and and uh, one of the things that they were kind of proud of is how they uh, approached and, and told a story in, in a slightly more like traditional and conservative way. And you'll, you'll see some of that. Uh, so for a business that's like really out in front on uh, brand strategy and communicating brand um, and building visual representations of brands, they're doing stuff like uh, saying being fiscally responsible that's really old school and traditional and just great business uh, fundamentals. And we get to hear some of that. And that's honestly, that's why they're kicking butt 10 years later. We have a lot to learn uh, and a lot yeah. to look up to. Yeah. And, and just to note, and I, I know we can't name them all, but Atlas has worked with so many local Asheville businesses and events, including Chow Chow Asheville, High Five Coffee, Ginger's Revenge, Poppies uh, handcrafted. They worked our, with Form and, Function, Form and Function, which was the our last interview with Miles Alexander, and so many others that you know that you would see them and you'd recognize them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so their work is everywhere. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And uh, we have so much more we could say, but we won't. We'll let this episode start. Uh, so, this is episode forty of the Making It in Asheville podcast with Dean and Lisa of Atlas Branding. Please enjoy. So to start, mm -hmm. 
where are we today? Uh, well, as far as like where we're actually sure. our space. Yeah. Well, you guys uh, were great to come to our studio here in downtown Asheville. Um, we're physically, I guess, located on Haywood Street downtown. Um, and uh, we've been here for, I guess, about six. Going into six years this year. Wow. Yeah, and we, we always debate whether or not we want to leave downtown, but it's, um, I don't know, there's something really nice about the kinetic energy downtown, and when you work with a lot of restaurants or events that happen downtown, to be able to just leave your office and quickly be there in 10 minutes just by walking is kind of nice. And we have that parking deck so right convenient to Rankin, which is kind of hard to leave, but we may outgrow this space in 2020. Mm. So, so we're trying to figure that out. Um, and so that's where we are physically. Um, and, and what was the other part of that? Well, sure. let's get people yeah. up to speed for maybe sure. those who don't know um, who Atlas Branding is and who you are. Yeah. How, how would you describe, describe what yourself. it is that you do today? Sure. Well, um, so Atlas is a branding and design studio. Um, we have been around for a little over 10 years now, which is kind of crazy to think that it's been that long. Um, and we're a husband and wife team and started out that way, at least for the first few years. And we basically specialize in helping our clients really build sustainable business um, through managing their branding. And we do that in the specific areas of just brand identity and strategy uh, packaging design and web design um, are kind of the three things that we've really focused in on and honed in on over the years. And we work with a specific industry that we kind of niched in at the beginning. Um, and I guess we can probably talk about this later, but uh, worked kind of more as a generalist and we're kind of working our way back into being more niche. And so we work primarily with food and beverage, restaurants, hospitality, and then events and event venues. And arts and artisans. Yeah. So that's kind of um, the nutshell of who we are. And just for, for fun to kind of set, we'll have done this whole intro at, at this point, mm -hmm. but like when you think of the highlights over the last 10 years, like what projects or clients have stood out to you as like this was particularly cool stuff that we've done? Oh, man. You're going to just like start with the, <laughs> <laughs> with a trip down memory lane. Um, it's, really, it's really hard to pick, uh, to pick ones in, in particular just because we've – to us, it's not always the project. Oftentimes, yeah. it's also the relationship with the client and who we're working with. Um, we got really lucky at the beginning. Um, the first three counts that we worked with and kind of landed were Valley Gourmet, which you guys just moving here probably don't know what that is, but now it's Takeout Central. Mm. It was owned by a guy named Keenan Hopkins here in town, and he ran that for almost 12 years before he sold it to his buddies that own Takeout Central. So a really cool restaurant delivery business before like, our little city had it before like any other um, cities had that kind of thing. It was in metropolitan cities, like the, it's like Uber Eats yeah. essentially, but a but little bit more, years ago. but 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah. He was the only one in town for almost 10 years. Um, and it was, you know, he would go to uh, Reza's and pick up your food for you and deliver it to you. And it was the same cost as if you were sitting there. The difference was that you were just paying a delivery fee and a tip. So that was one of our first clients, totally taking him through a rebrand process. Um, Biblio.com, which is one of the largest online bookstores for used and kind of rare antiquarian. Rare and antique books. Yeah. So um, they also wanted to go through a total rebrand. Um, and then Artisan Catering, which doesn't exist anymore, but existed in town for quite a long time as a catering uh, location and, and restaurant. Um, and so we started out with our niche and three really cool projects. And those really took us through the first year and a half. We had other projects we were adding to. Um, High Five Coffee came on really early. They continue to be one of our longest standing clients and friendships. Um, Jay Weatherly and, and Emily are just some of the best people. We have um, been through growth uh, pains and um, life challenges and things with them, and it's just been great to see them grow and be so successful. Um, I'm trying to think, do you have a highlight that comes to mind for you, Dean? Um. Yeah, I mean, it would definitely be high five would be a big a big highlight. Yeah, and then, you know, <laughs> going through the years, um, we added Ginger's Revenge in 2015 oh, cool. um, as a husband and wife team who wanted to. Uh, David had already been doing some marketing for breweries, and so he kind of realized that if he was going to do a brewery in town, it needed to be niche. Um, and so uh, Christina is gluten intolerant. 
And so they thought that they would do something that was going to be gluten-free because nobody was really exploring that avenue. Um, and so they worked on that for a while before they actually um, opened a couple years ago. They'll be celebrating an anniversary in March. Um, and, you know, there's projects that kind of like take you in different directions too, which is really cool. We started partnering with uh, Pasana that owns Bargello and District mm. 42 in the um, BB&T building that is now Hotel Eris. And um, that got us into fine dining and all the different pieces that you need for, for restaurants. And then that kind of led to learn meeting other restaurant owners and um, getting involved with Chow Chow this year. Um, it's been a really great year for us because we've allowed, it's allowed us to really kind of, as we go into our 11th year, kind of recalibrate and uh, really establish ourselves in that niche. Right. Yeah. 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 And so, and, and Asheville has been so, it's always been so great about supporting small business, but it's really supported us in that shift. Um, we've kept a lot of our clients that don't necessarily fit the niches because we care about them and mm-hmm. want to still provide services. But yeah, that kind of that turn brought in some new energy and some new excitement and some new growth. So fantastic. So I'd love to go back to 10 years ago. Okay. And if you could tell us what you remember about starting Atlas, moving here and sort of the defining moments for you in this whole business. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to start that one or do you want me to start? And then you can. Well, I'm from here. um, In a sense, I'm not necessarily a native. I wasn't born here, but I moved here when I was in high school in the late 80s. So a few years after college, I moved out to St. Louis. And that's where I'm through mutual friends met Lisa. And uh, we um, she was in the branding industry and she was working for a pretty well-known firm in St. Louis Mm -hmm. and um, my parents I'm an only child so my parents are um, getting up there in years and I just we just both felt like we wanted to be closer to my folks so um, I'm all they have and they're all I have as far as family outside of my wife so we decided it would be best best to move back to Mm -hmm. Asheville and well, no. it, and my family lives um, near D.C., okay. and um, Virginia is awesome for a lot of reasons, but they didn't have the culture and the arts and some neat mm-hmm. things that Asheville had, and so we were like, man, it might be hard to make it work in Asheville, but we'll try to kind of figure that out, because it's way cooler than, than Northern Virginia. <laughs> so. But we we did have some trepidation, because yeah, Asheville's not known for, wasn't known at the time for having a lot of jobs, right. and, which was one of the reasons I moved out to St. Louis, yeah. uh, was because of th- a lot of the employment issues that Asheville had. So, um, but Lisa was able to get a job working for an agency and we were able to move to Asheville. Yeah. So I landed my job first. Um, and then Dean was kind of still doing some interviews, but, um, we, in in St. Louis, the economy had already kind of started to affect things. That's a big car town. It has Anheuser-Busch right as we were leaving. It had just gotten bought by a Belgian company. Um, and people for the year of, this is 20, I'm sorry, this is 2007. People were already talking about it and getting worried in the Midwest. So, um, I remember kind of talking to the studio that was hiring me about it a little bit and, and wondering, okay, we'll, we'll still make this move, but it could be rough. Mm. Um, and so we, we moved here in January, 2008, or Dean kind of moved back and, uh, just kind of felt like it just wasn't going to be a good fit for a couple different reasons. And the economy was making it really hard at that uh, particular studio. And so, um, felt the need to start freelancing that summer. Um, and, trying to just make ends meet, but also just figure out different avenues. My father-in-law, who is like the most supporting, encouraging person, um, just kind of started saying, you know, I know you want to own your own business. And I know you thought you'd probably do it closer to 40. I was, um, when he was giving me these pep talks, I was 27. Mm. Um, he's like, but, uh, what if you, what if you thought about doing it now? I mean, Asheville's this place that really supports local and small business. You could give it a shot. And I just was like, you're crazy. No, I don't, I don't know that I I could do that. And, um, and then I started having a really close friend of mine who actually is our finance manager now. Um, and another really good friend be like, you know, I think, I think that you could do this and you know, your family, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, my mom has owned things on and off. 
Uh, my father owns uh, some urgent cares in Northern Virginia. My grandmother has a real estate company in Southern California, as she did. Um, and so they were, they are just really supportive about it. And so I um, started working on an, a business plan and, um, and thought about it and took about a year to dip to, to dip my toe in. And then I started freelancing kind of more regularly, September, 2008. Yes, no, September, 2009. Dean is the better person at uh, coming up with dates, um, or remembering dates. And I, um, just started to feel like I was going to land things that were going to become a conflict of interest pretty quickly. So uh, as in most things in life, when you make, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but one of the things that was really funny for us is when we thought we would probably go all in um, and do this, we had uh, people that we had places we had interviewed or people we had talked to who were like, oh, we're so interested in you, but we can't hire you because it's the recession and we're, um, we're going to go on a hiring freeze. We both had opportunities for other full-time jobs mm-hmm. right before we started. And I went to the job interview because um, I really liked the company. I liked the opportunity and um, was very open with them that, hey, man, we might be pulling the trigger in two or three weeks to start this business. Um, but they were still wanting us to wanted, wanted me to interview for this job. Um, we still ultimately, obviously, made the decision to start the company. Um, but it was one of those things where it's like the decision is already hard enough to leave a full-time job or leave a career to start a company. And then we had other opportunities open up and you're just like, Oh, I don't but want we it also to be even to harder work together. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it would have been, I and mean, that, that was a big thing is, is being able to open a business up together. And just, and just to be clear, you had already worked Lisa in, uh, in branding, right? You, or, or in design. Yes. Yeah. So I have a degree, a dual degree from James Madison university, uh, go Dukes. <laughs> Um, not even a football person, but it's kind of funny to say that. Um, yeah, in corporate communications and graphic design. So Mm -hmm. did two different majors, um, and pretty much started pretty quickly, uh, into getting into the design world. And so my background is in building brand identities. Mm -hmm. Um, the place I worked at in St. Louis was this really fantastic branding house. Not only did I feel like I learned a lot about quality of design and the process that's needed to to build brands, but also just like business savvy and Mm -hmm. acumen, um, from that location and then had moved to work at an advertising studio here in town. Um, yeah. And so I always really wanted uh, to at least spend 10 years in the industry working for other people. I wanted to have ideally three different creative directors to work under and really grow my career. I still think that's really important for designers because it just makes you into such a, a more impactful designer. Um, it helps you learn all different ways of looking at work. You learn from your coworkers. It's an ideal, but it wasn't what happened for me. Um, and I think that, I think that in business in general, and totally can continue talking about this, but I think in business in general, people um, have lost the ability to mentor or don't really want to take that approach with their staff or the employees. And so it, it almost was like, uh, with my experiences, sometimes their employees don't want it either. Yeah, I really wanted um, to be mentored and to learn from the people that I was surrounded by and to be inspired by them. And um, that just wasn't the, the opportunities I had before I started the company. Um, it was really much, very much like asking 20 questions, feeling a little bit um, like I was just like interviewing them and being a sponge and asking things, but not necessarily getting that back. And so um, it, it was, yeah, just that transition of like, hey, we're in Asheville. We want to continue to live here. We want to have a good quality of life here and make this our home. We're going to have to start a business to make that happen. And because branding was my background, I love it. I love graphic design. It's still one of my hobbies too. Um, and nerding out about that. Um, when we started Atlas, we knew that if we were going to do it, we had to figure out what our niche was going to be and we had to do it well Mm -hmm. because there were already some major players in this town. Um, uh, some of them are still around today and, um, we but, had to make sure but that a lot we, of them ceased to exist because yeah. of the recession too. Yeah, that's true. The recession did, uh, close a couple of places. Um, but also because I was a female in business and I was 28 years old and that was something that I knew was going to be a difficulty, um, because branding isn't something that you typically hire a couple of kids to do for your business. Like you're working with the business owners and the decision makers. It's a huge, it's a huge thing you've got to get right because otherwise, um, 
if you hit the market wrong and the market receives it a certain way and, and they take it and they're not going to tell and retell the story that you're hoping that they craft, it could really affect your business. Um, and I've seen things, you know, happen where it overnight grows people's businesses. It helps with sustainability or it completely, people are like, I'm not sure you guys have seen things out, out there when they release in the market and everyone's like, no, 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 don't, don't use that story or don't tell it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was. We knew it was going to be an uphill battle, and then you throw the recession on top of that. Um, mm. So we really wanted to be very intentional with how we launched, and and and, and we it. were hungry because we it, it, we were kind of in survival mode. Well, we went all in. Yeah. We like yeah. both did it full time from full the time. beginning. Um, there was no part time side gig job. N- neither one of us had a full time job either, and yeah. there wasn't a, there was no safety net. Yeah. So yeah. that one of us could cling to if. We d- didn't work out, and it also meant that we had to make sacrifices. Yeah. Yes. So. Do you do you remember any? I mean, you mentioned three of the first kind of clients. I think when you did the recap, do you remember? Or one of the thoughts that I, I'm having, and we, we discussed how different the world must be for you now, over ten years later, um, versus day one. So that like survival, hungry. This needs to work. We need to make this work. We need to make a living. We need to make a living. <laughs> so do you remember what it was like approaching clients? Like, were you pitching then? People weren't knocking down your door. I can't imagine when you just shang- hang a shingle up. So do you remember what some of those early, I don't know, uh, conversations about the business were like and how you were pitching versus what it's like today? Yeah, that's a great that's a great uh, question. We did go to some networking events and stuff. Yeah. So one of the f- main things we focused on early on was just educating Asheville and educating the market on what branding was. Mm. The conversation here in town at that point in 2008 was still surrounding logo. Logo. Yeah. Um, it was still a logo conversation. It Or advertising and marketing. Yeah. Or like, can I have a traditional advertising plan? I have $6,000 a month and I want you to figure out two or three places to put it. That kind of thing. Which some people still do. Mm -hmm. Some people call themselves branding, but they're really just doing regular old school marketing and advertising. So we, we really felt the need to have a lot of patience and, um, our, our like get started packet that we would give to clients or a lot of those initial meetings before we even really got into the, Hey, who are you and who are your customers and what do you love doing about your job? And where are the areas you want to grow? The conversations were a lot like here, here's what branding is. And this is what branding can offer your business. And this is how it can potentially allow you to make decisions as you grow that benefit you as a company and, um, help bring clarity to your customers about what you're trying to do. So, um, there was so much education at the beginning and we were, um, connecting with a lot of our vendors. Like we did a couple of presentations with Daniel's graphics where they could invite people that were their clients to talk about some of the principles. We, had, we called them the five elements of branding at the mm. time. Um, Sounds, and, sounds fancy, though. you know, case studies, um, you know, you... <laughs> sounds fancy, <It> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, now we... Everything is all about sound bites of information now. We're like, we have three. Okay, no, maybe we have two. It's from five to... You know, you narrow and funnel things down because our attention spans just aren't really improving as a culture. Um, yeah, so we... We really tried to prove that we could be experts in something, um, even despite my age. Um, and, and despite my lack of education in the industry, because I was coming to it completely fresh without any knowledge. But Oh, yeah, that was super fun. It's, yeah. It was like the... It was I was intrigued and- by her, <laughs> her work that she did at the agency in St. Louis, and would, I was al- would always ask her questions about it. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I'm, we're, we're 10 years apart in age... And so I grew up watching reruns of like shows like Bewitched and, you know, and then where you had people who worked in advertising yeah. agencies and the whole Mad Men thing. And it was always fascinating to me because I'm, I'm, I'm a creative as well. And so more interested in the writing aspect. And, and so that was, you know, intriguing. So I would ask her those, those questions. But, you know, starting off out of the gate, I was completely like just a blank slate. And sponging everything. Yeah. Yeah. So the other other part I was yeah I was gonna also say too was um, besides kind of trying to, to prove that you could be an expert in something we also really worked hard to build relationships. So we did do in the early years a lot of networking events. We uh, wrote a lot of blog posts back when people were reading them a lot more often. We um, 
we took a lot of lunches and coffee dates and just got to really know people knowing that not approaching it from the standpoint of like card pushing and like, Oh, what can you do for me? And here's what can I do for you? But Mm -hmm. more like, Hey, let's build a relationship. Let's hang out. Can I email you from time to time about this business question I'm having? You can email me about this kind of thing. And, we always approach any relationship we build. If they're going to be a client at some point, usually it's almost like it can sometimes be a year or two years before Mm. you see a person actually sow those seeds to becoming a client at some point. Um, but that was really important at the beginning, uh, because it allowed people, even if we weren't the right fit for them to stay top of mind and have them refer us to someone else. And I mean, and I love that. And that's something that we subscribe to as like a ethos. It's like, it's all mm-hmm. about the long game. Can you be a value today? Right. Can you continue to be? And then potentially maybe one day, uh, the value is returned in like a Don Corleone kind of way. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, that's great but, reference. but it's one thing, it's one thing to do that. And this is my gut guessing. It's one thing to do that 10 years in being in, from an outsider's perspective, the big dog on the block. And it's another thing to be like, you know, the, the starving artist, I jumped all in and we need to make this work. Mm-hmm. Like what, w- w- did you have like a little engine that could motto? Like, uh, it's going to work. We just need to commit. Like, or did you have, we didn't like, have any other options, you know, yeah. but like, yeah. but that so was, the yeah, long, yeah. I mean, that's a big part of but it was they, they're diametrically opposed though. Like the long game mm-hmm. and the put food on the table, yeah. make rent oh, totally. are not right. the same. Like, thing. Well, did you have a backup plan? Like, because we thought about that when we moved here. You know, we were like, okay, if, if this doesn't work, I'll get a job at High Five or something like that. And like, <laughs> I've always wanted to be a barista. It's fine. We'll make it work. Yeah. Every once in a while, Dean always, I still did this. I just did it a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I play, I, I play a game where I'm like, if for some reason Atlas didn't work anymore and we had to close it, which client would you want to go work for? <laughs> which client would you approach first for a job? Um, and he's like, you don't need to be playing that game. And I'm like, I know, but it's fun sometimes yeah. to think about that. Um, I am very, so I'm kind of the, the yes man in our relationship. Dean's kind of the no, the no man in the relationship. Um, we were very well balanced in our, uh, the ways that we approach things. I'm a risk taker. He's not so much. I was to this day, I'm actually still really shocked that he was willing to take our nest egg and go all in, in this business. Like sometimes I think to myself, like why? Cause I know that he, I mean, he does take risk if it's like there's some wisdom behind it and it's intentional, but I'm still kind of like, we were kind of crazy. Yeah. And you, you almost have to, if you're going to do something and you're going to go all in, you almost have to not know what's ahead of you. Cause if you know, like I'm in my late thirties now and if I had started the business now, I don't know that I'd actually start it. Cause I know now the work that goes into it. it's why we should probably like have kids young. Right. Cause we don't necessarily know until you've gone to like 20 baby showers and you're like, wow, this is going to change. This is going to change your life. This is a different thing. Um, so, so yeah, I, it, it was hard. Um, in the early years, it, there were a lot, those first six months were really hard because, um, not only was it a husband and wife joining a business, Dean was learning how to, he has a lot of kind of social work background. He knows he just loves kind of sociology and studying human trends and why we do what we do. Um, so and he, I was dabbling in copywriting. That was very so. intuitive for him to immediately start doing that, but he had to learn the process of like building a brand. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not the kind of person that wants to walk into a meeting and be like, sure, you want us to totally rebrand your 12 year old business. And you're going to be one of our first clients. Cool. Yes, we can do that. That's not, that's not Dean's personality. He's going to be like, are you sure you want to trust us with this? And I'm the one that's like, no, I know we can do this. Like, yeah. We're going to make this work. I'm going to walk you through the process that I know works and we're going to make this work. So, um, so yeah, there were a lot of like, oh crap, what have we got ourselves into moments, um, at the beginning, but, um, we just kept pushing through and we didn't allow ourselves to think past a year. Really. We were mm. like, we can do this this year. We can, we need, you know, three new clients this quarter. We need three new clients the next quarter. We broke it into incremental chunks that were like, if we, cause if we thought about like, what will Atlas be in three years, which of course you have to kind of think about for a business plan. But when we thought about it like that, we, um, it just, it just was too much. Um, because he was training, um, he is a linear thinker and likes things one at a time. And I am a multitasker mm. who could have six thoughts in my head and be totally fine with that. So a person that's like, like me is training a person like him, which would cause some really awesome 
uh, discussions, <laughs> heated discussions. And again, some of these people that knew us really well and loved us were like, what about a business coach? Or maybe <laughs> like someone that's kind of a counselor and a business coach to help you guys work together, which was some of the best spent money. It took us six months to get to there. We were like, we do need someone to help us figure out how to work together. And we worked with, um, with her on and off for a couple of years. Um, so that was really great. And then the other thing I think that helped us not, um, fizzle out too soon or just like get things like, Oh wow, this is going somewhere and this is becoming official is when we moved in, uh, to our first office, which took about, I think that was eight months in eight or nine months. Yeah. Yeah. We had Valley Gourmet had bought his first building and he Mm. really wanted the, wanted a second person in there. Well, he bought his building that he was in and he was like, I could really use you guys in this space. I think he just wanted to make sure he could cover rent and costs and everything. And we were like, we can't, but we can't afford all of this space (laughs) you're offering. And he was so gracious. And he was like, well, what about like half of this space? And it was like one of those situations where it was part trade and then like rent. Um, and we worked, we worked there for a few years. Absolutely love that building. It's little jumbo now. Um, I love going into little jumbo and you look up at the roof and when you see that weird diagonal line, that weird diagonal space was our office. Um, so that side door on the side, when you walk into that was our office and that really helped bring peace and clarity and, um, a better way of like, Hey, here's your lane and here's my lane. And these are the parts of our job that we're going to do. I hated working from home. I know Mm. that's, it's these days, a lot, a lot of people talk about how they love it, but Mm. I couldn't, I couldn't take it seriously. If I was working from home, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work. And going to an office was really helpful and just structurally, helping me think about work. Yeah. And so um, that, that was that very really helpful. That really helped to get... I think it helped her too. It did, but it also helped to legitimize things from clients' perspective. And I think that's one of the things that design... The design industry in town, folks may totally agree, disagree with me. This is just my personal perspective. But um, one of the things I think that's held the design industry back in um, the Asheville... Um, in, in the Asheville area is... Um, because of like the freelance mentality of Asheville, the the clients that would or that do have the money to invest locally but tend to hire people outside the area, they survey the area and they're looking for agencies that can prove that they've been here for a while and that they've done some growing and that they have a track record and case studies and references. And um and so they're not as willing because they have a lot to lose because they've been around for a while, um, to take those risks. And so I think that for us anyway, an office legitimized um, things and brought people in. Even if they were like, we want you to come 100% of the time to our space and come mm-hmm. to us, it's still like having that, that address an made a difference for us anyway. Was there ever anything when you were first starting out that you were like, crap, I don't know how to do this. We're going to have to figure this out. Like a, that a client came to you and asked you, hey, can you work on this project for us that you had to figure out how to do? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, there's, that was what, I mean, that's, that's when it was like, I think when you work for yourself at the end of the day, like you don't have a person that can like take the blame or the ownership for things. And so, you know, being in my late twenties, I was like, I just said that I can do this thing. Like, like a naming project, for example, naming is one of the hardest parts of branding. Meanwhile, I'm naming like, is one of the hardest parts. Yeah, and, I, and that, I'm like that having was a heart really attack. Hard too, is I was really, yeah, and, I, and that was that was what was really hard too. Is I was really glad that I had a couple of friends that I could talk to you about things because when you work together with your spouse and you live together, you can't and you can't honestly always show every side of yourself all the time. Like if I'm in a meeting with a client and I'm like, yes, we can make that happen, we can make that work, but I but I'm like, but we've never done. I've done this before, and my other positions and jobs, but as Atlas, we haven't done this. I can't show that vulnerability necessarily to Dean because he's coming alongside my passion and my hope and dream to make the business work. And now we share it together, obviously, but like, um, yeah, so that's definitely something Mm. that was hard is figuring out to, to express that, like, maybe we can't, what if these names don't come together? And, um, naming's always been something that 
we both love and love to hate Mm -hmm. because um, it's such a psychological thing. And it's oftentimes one of those things that clients really want to have a part in because they feel oftentimes like that's like, like, this is my business. I own this. I should own the ownership over the name. And so before we even approach naming at all now, we got to make sure that nobody is like, but I kind of want to come up with it. Um, So that was tricky. And um, for Valley Gourmet, actually, Keenan kind of knows about this. I can totally share this. But like we did a second round of naming um, and we literally had a bunch of our creative friends come over for Chinese food and beer. And we had a bunch of sticky notes and we were like, here's like the general goal. Here's where we where we want this to end. Um, And we were working on a bunch of sticky notes and sticking them up on the wall and like making words work and pulling them together uh, because um, because it's yeah, it takes a lot of like there's copywriting and then there's like naming. It's Mm. just it's just hard because it it has to make sense and make sense for the long term. And um, and then hopefully on top of that, be something that's trademarkable. So I don't know if that totally answered your your question. <laughs> no, but yeah. That comes to mind as something. Um, we tried marketing plans for a little short, like I think maybe three marketing plans. We knew we probably shouldn't have done it. We knew that we didn't really have a whole lot of interest in it. And then we don't have a lot of uh, confidence in traditional marketing well, that much, unless something's like just a major, amazing fit. Well, the um, recession, we were coming, we were, we were kind of one foot, we, not us, but the the country was one foot in and one foot out of the mm-hmm. recession. And so uh, social media was just really taking off. And so um, I think one of the reasons why we got out of the marketing plan thing is we realized that it was kind of a thing of the past. Um, not completely, but it was, it was, we, the social media was really becoming the, the place, the new medium, the new mm-hmm. medium. And it was w- going to get, at least get more attention from younger people in sure. business and, and marketing plans and all of that tended to be more of something that was of the previous era. Yeah. There was a disruption happening for sure mm-hmm. in that time. And if that's not a passion, it's definitely something that should be put down. And, and one of the questions that I've has come up for me is um, in a past conversation and you alluded to it a little bit here was the idea of like, in a dream, you would have wanted to start in your 40s, right? You would have mm-hmm. wanted to... Or like late 30s. Or late yeah. 30s, right? You would have wanted... The, you mentioned multiple creative directors. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you could attempt to say, like, what things do you think you would have gained having more time under different creative directors? And then maybe what things did you learn through the, you know, walking through fire yeah. that you're grateful for sure. and you could have never seen happening? Sure. That's a great question. Um, so as far as uh, to me, um, we almost as, as designers, I think it's very easy for us to get set in the aesthetics of our, uh, our decade of when we were in school, what we were exposed to during that time. You can almost kind of see it. If you want to be a relevant designer, um, you, you almost need to be like really studying, where things are going and how things change, not so that you can follow the trends. Cause I don't think branding is, is about following trends, but so that you can keep your, you can keep your relevance and you can, um, really continue to keep your skills sharp. Um, and so to me, I just love studying how I love studying business. Like that's something I'm just a nerd on my, like you guys have one of your questions about like, what do you do for fun? And I, I love to read business books or I love to read um, things and different memoirs by other designers because of different people's perspectives. And design is not an industry that has usually been paired very much with business. It's starting mm-hmm. to, people are starting to talk about like, how do you run a design studio? And there's books coming out about that. The, but, the business but aspect. historically, it's been like business and design. What? You don't put those two things together. Creative people can't run businesses. Um, and so I, I really the personalities of the, the different few, the few different places I did work before we started Atlas were those experiences were so different. Um, and the cultures were so different at both of those places that I, I think it almost positioned me to be able to start Atlas so, so much sooner because I had very two different extremes. experiences, two different extremes, two different size companies, two different types of work, um, ways of business versus were being ran. Um, and I just would have really have loved to have like one more, uh, because I think it, it could have allowed me to kind of contextually grow as a designer and learn other different, different design styles and, and ways of using software and illustrating and things like that. Um, so that's kind of why I think that that would have been really cool to have. 
honestly, I learned really well baptism by fire, like throwing me in the deep end. I, I do in the jobs I had, I loved it when a person was just like, here's a few tiny little details. I want you to figure out the rest. I don't need people to spell out everything for me. Um, I, I prefer, to, I am the opposite. I prefer <laughs> he is. And that's great. Um, I prefer to not know where the borders and the edges are. I just kind of want to know the basics. Um, what's the goal? What's the objective? And then I'll figure it out on my own. Um, and so it, I think it worked out the way that it was supposed to work out for us anyway, to, to start Atlas when we did. And I think that we're better for it learning as we go. Um, uh, as far as trials and tribulations, um, you learn so much from your, your failures. You really do. Um, more so than the successes for sure. So, um, yeah. For me, I, I don't think I would have ever imagined that I would be working in a creative industry, even though I know I'm a creative person. I, I just, in Asheville, I didn't think that I would be able to work in a creative industry. And so that's been great, but it's also, but on the other side of that, it, w- one thing that, has been helpful for me or is that I've learned in my baptism by fire is that the common perception in, in, in the culture today is the, the whole concept of following your passion. And this was not my passion at all. <laughs> uh, it wasn't that I hated it and it wasn't that I saw it as drudgery, although sometimes I did, <laughs> but it was not my passion and I didn't follow my passion. If I had followed my passion, I'd be, playing rock and roll, mm. which is what I wanted to do. Um, but that didn't work out. And a lot of times it doesn't work out, and that's the way it is. But I tinkered with this, and I worked with this. I worked with doing account management and, and worked with doing some copywriting and then strategy and all these different things. And, and, and as the more I did it, the more I honed in my craft, the more I began to like be able to do it better over time. And I still probably have a long way to go, but it, it, as you hone a profession, as you hone a craft, something that you may not necessarily have a passion for, you can actually develop a passion for it over time. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's one of the things that really people really need to hear is, is, um, is that sometimes you, a lot of times you can't follow your passion. Sometimes your passion follows you or, or, or sometimes something becomes your passion over time that you didn't pursue, but it pursued you in a sense. So, and, and it's, I think that it's been the, the whole idea of following your passion, I think is, is, is done a lot of damage for people. Um, you know, uh, and, and it's just, it's not realistic. And, uh, and it took me, you know, being in my mid to late thirties to figure that out. And so, but it's been now, it's definitely my passion. I love that. I love that too. And I think that there is something there about, um, you know, when you start being good at something, I think certain personality types take to that. Like they're like, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this. And then Mm -hmm. that in itself kind of feeds that work and that passion. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's, that's very interesting. And I think the recession probably had... Did did a lot to get people in the place where they was like, you know what, I need to do this to get food on the table Mm -hmm. and wait. Maybe this is um, after time. I'm actually learning a passion, you know. And I think it was just it's it can be said for previous generations when you had people that went into into um, into um, uh, trades, yeah, you know, kind of labor. Yeah, they they developed because they got better at it. They developed it, but. There's, you know, and I think it's good right now. These days, the trades are becoming more and more popular again because I think people are realizing that um, that that having a craft and a skill in a trade can be um, something that you start to enjoy after time. I'm I'm all in on that. I think that yeah. uh, to your point, I think passion is the result of pursuing curiosity and getting repetitions. Like mm-hmm. it is the outcome of effort over time it, it, you don't mm-hmm. you don't get to s- just find it by accident like, like i i have a college sports background and one of the it's it's kind of interesting that there's a um like real call it correlation but there's a moment when college athletes realize that they are no longer an athlete right like mm-hmm. 99.9 percent of college athletes stop playing sports after they graduate school um 
and there's this weird depression uh, that no one talks that much about, but it's it's real and everyone feels it. And it's this lack of passion. It's this lack of I would like I'm passionate about the sport. And the reality is like you're only passionate about the sport because you played it for 16 years. Mm-hmm. Like that's it. Like and you mm-hmm. you weren't passionate about it when you were eight playing football you played it because it was kind of fun and because your mom signed you up for it Mm -hmm. like to have you have something to do and hang out with the boys now all of a sudden it's gone and now it's gone but Mm -hmm. like it it, the same process of showing up every day and going to practice Mm -hmm. is how you end up being passionate about it 10 years later i still like playing guitar but it didn't it didn't work out for me but hey here we are no big deal Yeah. yeah And there's yeah. something to that, like protecting your passion as well, protecting your craft, maybe from, you know, you don't have to go all in in order to enjoy it or to, yeah, the, to the Liz live Gilbert. into that. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how we digressed so no, far into I this, but it's an interesting that topic. That was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I would love to know, I'd love to go back a little bit. I know you mentioned that you guys, you know, that, that having an office space helped a lot with your relationship working together as a husband and wife, as well as like going to... Uh, like a business coach as well to help. Was it a business coach? Yeah, yeah. I would say or, it was like half and half uh, okay. counselors. Yeah, slash, it was a person she that was, was a mar- really marriage counselor who had a business experience. Oh, yeah, she perfect. was a vice president of Wachovia of Human Resources of Wachovia Banks. For I hope I'm going to get an email where she's like, it was actually this bank. Um, <laughs> now that I'm thinking Wachovia. about Wachovia, um, mm-hmm. but um, but yeah, that she she had already kind of worked with a lot of husband and wife couples, but just understanding like personality testing and the receiving information, and giving and receiving information, um, and and process like and I because of the fact that I'm kind of nonlinear and work in clusters, I'm very bad about process it doesn't interest me it makes me actually tend to want to go linear process the other direction mm-hmm. i'm always like i love Why? to come up with processes i love to try it out but i'd like to use it once or twice and then try something else out <laughs> and tell someone and, else it's a great process right, like, this is yeah. a great process i built right you should use it <laughs> you know <laughs> right, like right that's me <laughs> exactly and and dean is like no 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 this process works it's the one that the clients understand it takes us down the road of where it needs to go. Um, and we understand why it works. Yeah. And we joke, you know, our partnership has been really helpful, I think, in growing our business too, because we, we joke with other couples that we meet or other business partners that we meet that are similar to us. Like one is the balloon, right? That's like always wanting to fly back up. And then the other person's kind of that, the person that's holding the string, lets it out a little bit sometimes, pulls it back in, lets it out, pulls it back in. Um, and that's what gets it done is you need those visionaries and you need those implementers and they are equally just as important um otherwise nothing gets done everything gets talked about and probably to death but nothing Mm. actually gets done uh and so it can cause the most interesting uh, arguments um but it it's worth it uh, basically and i completely interrupted you and what you were trying no no that that, i mean that Um, was it i i you know just really wanted to go deep and like how do you manage to work together as a couple because it's something that we are experiencing ourselves yeah working from home Working together as a couple, having yeah. different personality types and different love languages and all this. Oh, yeah, the love yeah. languages. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, w- I would, just a side note, I would recommend trying to find an office somewhere. Yeah. If 20, you can. It's really yeah. hard to find affordable yeah. office space. I think probably in any big city, but here it is. A closet. <laughs> um, our, our space was a closet. Ironically, that closet actually had a little, like, kitchen, a dine-in kitchen and its own and bathroom, bathroom, too, which was kind of yeah. crazy. We got pretty lucky with the first office. Um in thinking about the question you guys have posed a couple of times, um, one of the other things besides defining process, going through case studies, educating people, having an office space, we, and this is one thing I think that folks who are fortunate to open up businesses now um, probably don't have to deal with as much, but we had to say yes a lot. Um, We didn't turn our noses up at projects because the project wasn't interesting. If the client valued branding or they valued an aspect of it, if they were a really awesome person and we could tell it was going to be fun to work with them, um, it didn't matter if you were bringing us uh, an engineering catalog where we were illustrating 17 illustrations of pipes working underground if you checked the boxes as far as like just the value and the relationship and you had trust in us, like we were going to, we were going to take that on. We didn't immediately say we're only going to do this or that or um, scale back. We really always looked at the client and, and tried to see that it would be a relationship and we're willing to do it. And that meant that being a designer wasn't always fun. (laughs) Mm. The projects weren't always fun. Um, But that, that's why I think it took. And that goes back to the passion thing. 
Yeah, it, it was more important for us to keep Atlas going, make it sustainable, disprove the view and the perspective of what design studios were in Asheville, and just try to keep going. And, you know, one project yield another project, which yield another project. And then, you know, as you get to a point where you are sustainable and you can see out six months, then you're able to be like, okay, maybe we can start to say no to some things. And I think that that's one thing with folks I meet now they say no really early. And I'm like, but you don't know that that engineer might actually like all his best friends might be chefs, mm. you know, and you may not know that. Like you, you don't know if, if the client is a, is a great person and, and is, is it's a great business model. It, it might actually yeah. work out really, really well. And don't say no to everything at the beginning. And to your point too, like I think trying things out and being like, you just tried out marketing plans and you're like, all right, that didn't yeah. work. And oh, then yeah. you pivoted and We've that's, done that a lot. you have to do that in order to figure it out. Yeah. And it wasn't just because I didn't enjoy them. It was also like, we're not of use to our clients on this. And so let's go find an amazing photographer, an amazing person that loves doing marketing plans and let's hire them and let's come alongside. Yeah, sure. We're going to maybe lose a little bit of revenue here, but like, then that's going to be better off for our client because our client now has two professionals working on this and is going to get the best outcome. So going back though, at the same time, it is important to be able to say no to certain things too, and be able to, 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 to know when to say no. And I think that's been helpful as well. Cause I think a lot of times you, you can get, you can let fear control you mm, and yeah. you can, you can be like, Oh, but you know, we don't know what's coming down the pike. What do we do? Uh, I really don't want to work with this person. It's sketchy, uh, but I'm really scared and I'm going to do it. And most of the time, I'm not saying always, most of the time it comes back and bites you in the, if you, if you were to have said yes. Yeah. 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 And we, we figured out pretty early on that, our very first year, the January, February, and March, we started in October. So we were like, we were pretty lucky that first year because we, the projects were going to be like at least a six month type of a project. But that first quarter is always a little bit slow in our industry traditionally. And, uh, and it's mostly because a lot of times people's marketing budgets, unfortunately, it's not what I'm saying they should do, but what they do is they wait until they pay taxes mm. and then whatever they have left, they delineate for marketing. Oftentimes it's kind of a funny thing. And so that you, you don't get a lot of projects those first few months we learned like, okay, that's going to be when it's ghost town and there's like tumbleweeds rolling down the office. We need to go ahead and um, save, save money, which we saved a ton. Like when I was freelancing for a while before we even started, I think the yeah. first year it was save like, money. it was just me freelancing on a couple of projects. It was like $13,500 of what I made and just went right back into the business. And we lived pretty, I don't, I don't think we took our first raise until year five which is going to sound kind of crazy, <laughs> but we just wanted to make sure we built up the reserves. And I guess that's what happens when you start a business, business in the down economy. We mm. wanted to have a really nice savings for the company. We wanted to make sure that we had, when once we started hiring, we had enough to be able to like pay that person. Even well. if you had a quiet month or quarter. Exactly. And I mean, we have, you know, there's lines of credits and things like that mm -hmm. too, but we just really wanted to be fairly intentional behind making it last so that if there was six months where you know things weren't coming in we could pull from the savings we could um figure out different ways and do you know try to do different marketing and we have always tried to when we know there's gonna be a slow time several months before that time start yeah. to amp things up a bit always looking ahead is really important i think uh, a lot of a tendency for people in the creative industry is is to to have blinders on when it comes to what's down the pike mm -hmm. and being able to see things being being able to strategize all right how do we connect A to B? How do we get here to here? And how do we do this without, you know, blowing ourselves up? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So in a, in a past life, uh, 2014 or so, I was a super young, like, consultant. I had worked on some Kickstarter campaigns for people as, like, the marketing strategist. I was doing a bunch of copywriting. And uh, I, I felt so good good because I brought in a bunch of clients and I now I had all this work to do. And I was like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to build a team. Like, let me just get this going. And then all the projects came to an end mm -hmm. and I hadn't done the things that got me all those clients. Cause I was digging out of the work that I had backlogged and, uh, seeing down the road and delivering what you promise people is like a really interesting balancing act that I don't know how many creatives if they just set off on their own mm -hmm. like I don't think that's 
obvious mm -hmm. that like all of the work you do to get people to come and say yes needs to continue to happen while totally. you're also delivering. And that's like, for me, it's almost like two different brains. It is. Well, mm -hmm. I, I think there's this myth that that doing that is, it defeats the whole idea of spontaneity in art. Mm -hmm. And that to be a creative, it's always, everything's going to be spontaneous mm -hmm. and everything's going to be free flowing. And, and ooh, that's, I don't want to do that because that, that's, that's too businessy and professional and I don't corporate-y. Mm. The, um, you know. I think one of the things that was super helpful uh, early on with the recession was um, when I was at Toki uh, in um, St. Louis, Eric Toki, the owner um, in 2017, I can't remember if he like sat us all down or if it was just a few of us, but he was basically like, listen, y'all, we have enough money saved up to like keep this company going well for at least two years. Like we don't want you to allow what's happening with the recession to affect how you feel about your job. And I just remember being like, Holy crap, yeah. there are 34 of us. And you're saying you've got enough money to be able to like, keep us, keep this going, the ship going. If like, that is amazing. Well, um, it's amazing that he, he was willing to do that. I, before I left, which, um, uh, one of the things I was, he, I started working more directly with um, the owner of the company. And again, I peppered him with questions. Um, but I remember asking him like, you know, cause I think at that point, maybe it was like 15, the company was like 15 years old, 12 years old. Um, I remember asking him with his company, like what, what would you say has allowed you to make a lot of the decisions that you get to make? And cause they said no to projects all the time. And he just said, you know, diversification is key. He's like, do you ever wonder why we don't have the car dealerships or the anheuser Bushes or things like that? And I'm like, no, I haven't really wondered, but why don't we have those? We totally could. And he was like, I don't really want those. I want all the small businesses. I want, um, I want to work with the mom and pops and, and those different things. And the main reason is that when one of those companies leaves, they're like 3%, 5% of our business. Um, and, and I don't have to let any of you guys go. Like mm. it doesn't change how Damn. things run. I just find one client. And I just remember just like sitting there looking at him going, man, that is so smart. And I think he learned that from, he had a pretty seasoned, um, career before he started his company. He was able to start it, you know, in his late thirties or early forties. Um, and I, that, and just everything that he kind of would say to me about business when I would ask him and that he was kind enough to share to this like young kid that was, I wonder, I mean, I'm sure he's probably like, Oh gosh, like this is gonna be wasted on her. Totally wasn't Eric. It totally wasn't. Um, but, um, I, that's exactly how we were. And I've seen companies come into town who are like, we want to put Atlas. I'm sorry. We want to put Asheville, not Atlas. Freudian slip, um, on the map for being the largest design studio or advertising agency in Asheville. And the approach is growth. The approach is being big. It's hiring all of these people. Diversi these big diversification won't get after. you that. It'll get you slow, steady, incremental growth, but it will also mean that you can be around for as long as you kind of want to be around if nobody's more than 15, 18, 20% of your business. And that so, goes back to several questions that you asked about you know, our success is, it, 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 if you want to call it success, is slow and steady wins the race. Mm -hmm. And instant gratification, unrealistic aspirations is just, you know, not not going to cut it, or at least not in a post-2008, 2009 recession. And we we saw that and, you know, like what Lisa's saying, and that was that was our approach. And like I said earlier, saving money, yeah, and not being not spending a lot of money. Uh, honestly, very old school. I know, we sound super sound, boring. No, but it's so <laughs> old school, traditional business kind of stuff. And you know what? It, it's reality. I, it's I've, realistic. I've seen so many designers like move here and relocate here to work for different studios and things, and then they end up getting having their job for about six months, and then that client because that's the thing too about big clients is. They want fresh and interesting creative, and they often have the misconception that they need to switch studios in order to keep things fresh. And so when you see an Anheuser-Busch or wherever, not I'm saying that they're like this, but um, when you see a large client, they may stay with your studio, if you're lucky, two years, and then they pick up and they move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many agencies across the country, really, size up, size down, size up, size down. And that's really hard if you're trying to build trust <coughs> in an industry and that's probably why we ha have a lot of freelancers today is it's hard to, to deal with that model. It's not a really sustainable model. And we just knew early on that that wasn't what we wanted. And we wanted to 
make sure that the folks that we offer jobs to, even if we're our six, we're six people, that they have benefits, that we are offering different things, that they know that their job will be here for them if they want to stay with us. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is important too in our approaches is is we we're, we try to work with clients and contextualizing what we do with our clients and not necessarily trying to do a set style right. in our work. Did yeah, you want to say more to that? That are you seem like you were. Just a, a question, and this might also be part of like the uh, agency strategy that is lost on us. But the idea of like if you are delivering whatever the solution is one time, and it's a four month project, and you deliver when you say you're going to deliver, how is that different than having some sort of like ten year relationship with High Five? And I don't know if that. If it's a continuous thing or just every time mm-hmm. they need work, they come mm-hmm. back and it's a three or four month project. Um, but what does repeat business look like versus one offs yeah. in a in a model like yours? Yeah, so um, that's a that's a great question. Uh, so we don't because we don't value qu- um, quantity all that much. Uh, we have probably, I think we're something around 88% retention of clients. That doesn't mean that we're doing, we're working with all 100 something clients that we have like all, all the at time. once. It means that they're coming kind of on and off and they know now to give us heads up usually if something's coming down the way, but we kind of promise our current client base, like, listen, if you need something from us, you come first and, um, we're going to always make sure that there's time for you. Uh, but what that has meant on the other side is that we can't take on a lot of new clients all that often. Uh, so we take on typically only three to four new clients per quarter. Mm. Um, and we grow in incrementally. So if you're signing a contract with us and we're, we know it's going to be a year long project and we know it usually tends to go on beyond that, we'll probably then look at how many of those contracts we have and then kind of hire, um, as, as needed for that, as opposed to like hire before, you know, we know we're going after kind of certain kind of work, but we don't really have the contract yet. Mm-hmm. We tend to, to really wait and wait it out. So, um, so we've always, I've always kind of thought that it's more expensive to acquire new clients than it is to keep the ones that you have. Um, yeah, but that becomes tricky too, because with brand identities, we don't do a lot of the production work. We don't really do like social media management on a regular basis. We don't really love doing ad resizes or if we've kind of put together the brand identity, so we're totally okay if clients at that point, and a lot of our clients have gotten to a point where they will grow and then they can hire someone on staff to be the production artist that takes the packaging that we've done and then they are like implementing it over and over again. And then we're like, hey, this looks great. Let's course correct a few a few places here, there, and there. Um, so we, we um, it's a both and, like it's it's knowing that and it's, there have been times of year where we've been like, okay, we, we can't take anybody new on right now because we have to meet our promises that we've mm. promised to these clients. Um, and that gets hard too, because people don't like hearing no. And so if people call and they want to work with you and they're excited to work with you and you're like, we're six months out, or I really feel like I could refer you to these few people. They do a really great job. What are your goals? I can align you with these designers. Um, it, it's, um, it's tricky because that's not what people expect. They expect that when they call you, you're going to be just as excited and you're going to want to work with them too. Um, and that sometimes isn't the case because of the fact that it's so important to us that we, that we do what you were saying earlier. Like we're delivering what we say we're going to deliver. And we also got to make sure we plan ahead of time to be able to leave that space in our projects in our project capacity for your other projects. It is a, it is, it's a little bit nuts. And I don't honestly, what's kind of surprising is, is I don't have this like giant spreadsheet that I keep track of all this on. Um, the Dean and our business coach, she called, they call it my matrix and I kind of step into it every day. We're now that we're growing, I'm having to figure out ways to like document this stuff yeah. because if something happened to me, they need to, they, the matrix needs to exist, not just in my head. Um, so funny. but, um, but yeah, but yeah, it is a balancing act for sure Wow. Yeah. with that. How are you thinking about the future and like what, what projects or new directions, uh, is Atlas going into? Yeah, so we um, f- so we last October a year ago, as we knew we were heading into ten years, we decided to take that plunge and say, okay, let's. Uh, as I'm getting closer to forty, Dean's getting closer to fifty. Let's really do what we know that we're good at. We know that we can deliver results on, and that we honestly 
have fun. I'm kind of going against all the passion talk Dean just said earlier, but <laughs> that I'm passionate well, you went about, into your passion. about working. I know I can't be the one that talks about, sits on a chair and talks about that. I'm fortunate. I'm one of those small percentage of people that got a degree in something and was able to go straight into doing it, which is, I'm, I know that I'm lucky to be able to do that. Um, so where we are kind of right now is we are trying to work more on food and beverage, beverage and restaurants and then the course events and, and arts and artisans. Um, so we're taking more of those projects on, which means we're also, it's been pretty cool to be able to regularly refer to other designers and different people who do other things that, um, allows them to grow their businesses and kind of incorporate that into the design community in general, because we are turning down certain things that we're just not doing much of anymore. So we're at a place where we can kind of pick and choose what we're wanting to do. And it sounds super snobby saying that, and I don't mean for it to, uh, sound that way. Um, we're being able to narrow our focus a little bit more. Um, but that also means that we need to think more regionally. Um, and we're, that's kind of what we're looking at into 2020 is, um, talking to a couple different people to help us up our social media management game and um, doing a little bit more with SEO and trying to uh, think about drivable cities that we can start to potentially have a presence in. So that's. But the funny thing is, 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 as, as we were trying to do that, we start getting more and more actual clients contacting us um, that are in our niche. And so yeah. it's like, Oh man, it's yeah. like, we're trying to get out of Asheville, but now we're getting more and more so Asheville we're, people we're contacting that us. Out. It's funny. Like I've, I've talked to other people that hit the 10 year mark and you would think that people would kind of lose steam around that time. And you'll find like, just like we, even with a marriage, like there's certain years that you're just like, I feel like I am just churning butter. Like this just feels weird. And then there's certain years that you're like, yeah, this is a great year. When's the shoe going to drop? You know, yeah. like this is too good to be true. Yeah, We're always so, asking when the shoe's going to drop. And I think it drop. feels like it's very much like year one with the business. almost. Like it's like, okay, cool. We hit 10 years. Now it's like we're year one. Like we're more willing, I think, which is funny because you think that you would be less willing to take risk, but I feel like we're a little bit more willing to take risk now. I think we... I was going to say too, like we talked all about like being intentional, um, which I think is really important. But um, I also think that starting a business in a recession has also helped held us back a little bit because I think we look at everything like, oh, well, maybe maybe this won't work out. And so we mm. maybe we shouldn't do it or something like that. It hasn't it's, held us back. Well, anyway, I, th- <laughs> I think it has in some in some ways. But um, but yeah, so I think for us, we're looking more regionally, staying a little bit more within our focus. I don't know what size our team will be. I think we're adding another, probably another full-time designer next year. So we'll probably be at seven. I'd like to keep it under 10 because I don't think that my personality type probably manages people all that well. Hmm. (laughs) Um, But I don't know. We let it kind of happen intentionally. And if we, we just look at ourselves and say, do we still love who we're working with? Does our team still love working here? Are they enjoying their jobs? Are we doing all that we can for them? Um, is this, is this working out well and is this sustainable? And if it is, then we'll let the growth kind of happen organically. And when it starts to feel like it's just not right as I guess when we would stop or scale back. So that's, that's, so as I'm thinking about that, one of the thoughts is a good luck and congratulations. And I'm sure it's going to be a awesome year, uh, is the plan. It seems like at this point, when you say like, we get to make some decisions on who we're working with it seems like you've done the work and it's inbound at this point. Like people are knocking on your door via email or otherwise to say, Hey, we'd love to work with you. Is the plan as you expand regionally to drivable cities to, to do the work, whether it's by putting your own stories on social to have people in those cities reach out to you or are you going to knock on doors and whatever Charlotte or whatever via email and outbound sales? Yeah. Um, it, it's more, I think probably, and we, we can kind of look at that, um, as we go, but I think it's also, it's starting with like looking at trying to figure out how to be an expert in something. We've got friends who are already in some of these cities who are like, listen, this, this part of the market is growing here, yeah. but nobody really knows what they're doing. We think that this would be a great place for you to try to come in as an expert and help them with this. It could be something similar to what, um, we did when we started this, we've never really had the approach where we've done a lot of cold calling because it, right. doesn't it doesn't really seem work. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's working through our network and our relationships. Um, I believe SEO has done fantastic things for us. Um, it's really, it's, it's something that I've always really enjoyed kind of working on. And um, it, it allows me to use more of an analytical part of my brain that I 
that I don't get to use quite as, as often. Um, so that's worked out really well for us. And so no, at this point I don't have plans. I think it's more like joining some different groups there and Mm -hmm. getting building relationships there and getting building a referral network there is more of the approach as opposed to, to that. And it's funny because like, um, I originally kind of thought maybe we'll have like one other location and start a location there. But as I look to case studies of people who are five years down the road from where we are, who I highly respect their work and the way that they do it, they're always like a little bit ahead. I'm like, okay, that didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. They've relocated their whole team to like one place and that creative team stays together. And then they've done other mark. Like I, I kind of always am looking at what other folks are doing in bigger cities, um, and what works for them. And, um, I like to stay. I do want us to stay small, and I guess small to me. I'm defining. We don't want to. We don't necessarily want to get greedy, yeah. and and I think that's yeah. what oftentimes motivates people. Is 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 <clears throat> for us? It's more about doing good work and enjoying the relationship with our clients. And it's not just about success for the sake of success, just so you can put money in your ears and go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what Eddie Izzard says. Yeah. You know, it's it's Indeed. more about just just doing good work. And, and and continuing those relationships yeah. with the clients. So I'm not putting this like um, I'm not putting this like goal on on myself to be like we're going to get three new clients in Charlotte and yeah. that's going to be what we do. Um, it's not really totally like that. It's more like putting like ha- like putting the presence there and seeing kind of what happens, dipping the toe in, and and a couple places at once and see like see where yeah. are the cities that are going to be the most. Um, the ones that work the most. And I love that because effectively what I was trying to unearth was 10 years later, does the strategy change if you were moving towards a new city? And it seems like, no, it's like relationship focus and it's the same thing. Just now you have 10 years worth of case studies. Uh, which yeah. is, seems badass. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny you say that because I'm like, I, to me, this probably sounds like gibberish to you because I'm not like trying no. to say we have this like, we just don't, we don't grow by like projections of numbers mm-hmm. or trying to find, um, because we just, we learned that that just felt arbitrary if yeah. it wasn't like. Have you read any it. Jason Freed? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's kind of where a lot so of So you're comes. all like rework and. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, his, his latest book, It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work is what. It's it's funny. It's like Dean's whole ethos, but it, for me, it was like reading it. It was like so liberating. Yeah. I'm like, you're right. It doesn't have to be crazy at work. Like so, things can be. And I already been telling her that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, I um. We'll link so to all the like Jason Freed plan. books. I, there just, you go. Just say so everyone give you the list. Yeah, we'll get we'll link um, to them all. Of his books. Cal Newport's also somebody. To- mm-hmm. Deep work, right? Um, deep yeah. work. Yeah, and then um. What is it? It's either the quote from Steve Martin, "Be so good they can't ignore you." Yeah, or so it's, it's 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 exactly that. So good, yeah. you, they can't ignore you. Is that the title that he titled? It's his the book title too? of the book. Yeah, yeah. And, and Newport is a little on the divisive side, so for a lot of people, because he's the not the not his personality or his presence, but like what his the, ideas. The oh, yeah. idea yeah. is people are like, but that just sounds boring and like a lot of hard work. But that's I mean that's the hedgehog Jim Collins in uh, Great by Choice, or mm. uh, you know whatever good to great it's like the hedgehog mentality it's like can you put your head down the the great ceos are boring full stop you know there are interesting ceos but the greatest ones have been historically really boring and that's 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 always been hard for me to swallow because i'm like a seven if you're an enneagram and uh, otherwise big personality on all the tests and i i it it does make sense though Mm -hmm. makes sense for sure yeah um so books are great. Oh, yeah. books. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. books oh, um, yeah, Alina, Alina Wheeler, um, wrote a book called design brand identity. It's mm-hmm. like the Bible of branding. It is, it is a cor- It's like a, it's basically like a course book, but she is it's a textbook. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. A lot of find pictures. It. He helps to finish my sentences too, which <laughs> is much needed oftentimes. Um, yeah. So that, that book is like just this amazing book about like just approaching branding from every angle and, and what it means and why it's so powerful. And, um, I'm not necessarily recommending that. I guess it'd be more of a read for other creatives. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely not a light read, but it's a worthy read. Um, she helped guide a lot of thinking and filled in gaps that I didn't necessarily get from some of my other experiences. Um, and trial by error too. I think we've been so fortunate that a lot of our clients I would say are, are, um, in some ways disruptors in their industries. And 
they're willing to take goal. Like they're will. it took risks on us. Like mm. just even those first few people that were clients, like we're like, we'll do it. Yeah. We'll jump in this with you, with you and we'll figure this out. And if it doesn't work out, that's going to be okay. And we'll all course correct together. Um, I think that that's, uh, something that is really powerful and great and, um, has allowed us to be able to help them build brands that build their businesses because, um, there have been terms that we've been like, Nope, this doesn't work. And, and why we've all been able to stay in relationships together because there have been some things that were like, okay, oh, clearly this was not the right course. Uh, but maybe if we just make these few minor tweaks, it'll make all the difference. Um, and they've been willing to do that because of that trust that we, that we get the privilege of having from them. So, um, but yeah, I think we already, those were the books that I wrote down. So I wouldn't forget. Awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. I'd love to pivot and know what you guys do outside the office. I know you said that you read a lot of business books, which we <laughs> touched upon, but, but like, you know, what else? What else are you guys into? You want to answer that one first? Playing music is yeah. my oh, guess. Yeah. yeah. I still fiddle around on my bass and I've played with some friends. Um, get together from off, time to time. Get together from time to time. And, you know, I read a lot too. And, um, uh, I used to watch a lot of movies. I don't watch as many, many these days but music is collect, collecting vinyl cool just just that kind of stuff just more into that and art interest in art and design yeah i like to cook a lot we have a little dog that we love to to hang out with and take out around town and um uh just to love exploring the different shops that open trying all the different new restaurants because there's always something like right now especially it's just, oh, man. things are constantly opening right now it's crazy it's great um and kind of hanging out with some friends at those different places and catching up with people um we're trying to as we i think one of the things we are as we're trying to systemize and pro- make things more of a process um take a little bit more time for travel and mm. you know being able to go to other places that was really kind of hard to do in, in the early years um we learned not often and not soon enough that you should take vacations when your clients take time off. So when there's like a time that seems like everyone's kind of in hibernation or everyone's gone off to the beach, mm. that's when you should go to. Um, so yeah. So I had to get, I had to get Lisa off of Facebook so she wouldn't see so many people who were traveling everywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't politics so much for me. that got me off Facebook. It was more like seeing all these luxurious trips and going, why are my friends? I love my friends, but <laughs> why do they get to take these trips? And so, um, how do they afford it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we um so we're trying to do a little bit more of that um and I'm um yeah, and so some things that we I guess it sounds kind of boring. We like to call ourselves active indoorsmen. So, <laughs> we great. we're more beach people living in a mountain town, so we're not going to be the people that you would ask for like the hikes and I the trips that. and things like that. That's so good. I have <laughs> I love that. I have one last uh business question if sure. you'll allow me. Go for it. I just as a as a concept when thinking about clients and thinking about work, how do you see the difference in branding? Like someone comes to you, I have this idea. I want to, I want to launch this new rat trap versus, um, rebranding. I've been making these rat traps. We need to jazz it up or out of whatever. No idea. Like, (laughs) what is the weirdest example of rat? I mean, that's that's not far off. That's just like, that's a classic, like, you know, you're making the better rat trap. It's everyone's business is just a version of somebody else's. But I'm wondering when you are there at the inception day one, you're building a brand with them versus they've been at it for 10 years and they want a fresh coat of paint and Mm -hmm. they want to reimagine what they can be. How do you how do you guys think about that, or you both think about that? Um, because I, I, that's a question that I wouldn't know. Is it the same process? Is it a different process? Yeah, surprisingly, it can be the same process. I think um, there's a lot more psychology that goes behind the rebrand. Um, you've got to before you can ask, you can even get into like how do we approach this or how do we do this. You've got to ask the questions before the questions, which are like. What about the brand do you still love? What needs to stay? What will upset your customer base if you make changes? Um, and why do you do what you do? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think really getting underneath, we have to get underneath of everything before we can start because um, you can't probably take, 
you, it's we don't advise for a lot of our rebrands depending on depending on the circumstances and how long they've been in business to completely scrap everything mm. because oftentimes if you have a loyal following of people that's going to really upset them um especially if you don't communicate that you're getting ready to scrap everything um and so we um we really try to make sure that early on we understand where I guess the ba- the borders and, and the, the boundaries are for where the creativity can happen. Um, but as far as the process that we would take them through and the strategic planning, that is still fairly similar. Okay. Um, it just is um, a little bit, I wouldn't say it's necessarily longer. We always encourage a transitional campaign. We always encourage like some handholding and some letting informing folks like here's what we're changing and this is coming down the road, but here's why. Like, mm. this is why we're doing this. It's not so that we can just like immediately start to charge more money to you all, because that seems to be always what people are concerned about when you rebrand. Um, we haven't necessarily formed a partnership or have sold to someone else, although that can happen too. Like, you have to explain to people, like, why are you doing this? With, um, with new businesses that are branding and starting out, they don't really know yet who their customers are going to be. They don't know a lot of those things. You know, one of the things I... It cracks me up and I just love for Ginger's Revenge is we were planning on aiming towards women and a lot of breweries don't think about their female drinkers when they think about um, their packaging design and being um, one of the co-owners is, you know, this husband and wife team as well, um, wanting to really be female focused, especially in the gluten free market, because that's oftentimes women that take that step to eliminate that from their diet. Um, they really wanted uh to uh, make sure that we made it very friendly and appropriate for women um, and have a pretty strong narrative with a lot of their branding. But um, they have a huge contingency of men in Asheville who want to support local breweries who want to drink beer, but don't really like beer. And so they're kind of like the Bud Light drinkers and things like that. And they prefer things to be a little bit more light, um, a little bit more fruity or just have a lot of flavor that are more kind of fruit notes or floral notes. And sweet. Or sweet. So they have this contingency of men that they never thought they were going to have who hang out and are like some of their deeply loyal customers because of the fact that they um, just resonate with ginger beer and love it and love drinking it. And then they feel great because they can support a local brewery and that they couldn't necessarily support otherwise. So things like that that you don't know when you're doing branding. And so there's a lot of unanswered questions and some more risks to take just because you're trying to figure it out as you go. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, yeah but that's I, kind of, I love that because I'm, I'm, we're looking at one of the walls of oh, yeah, things that, you, that you've made in the packaging. And it, it seems like, and I don't want to, I don't want to guess, but it seems like your branding, your work launching with them legitimizes all of it in a way that uh, if they had started maybe five years and then rebranded it would be somehow wildly different like that i don't know what poppy was like before you guys showed up but i i don't know of a single popcorn brand that looks better Uh, i can't imagine there being one and it's uh it uh, were you there from day one with poppy for example we weren't but we were pretty early pretty early um and thanks yeah thanks for saying that she um was she so she heard it's a retail yeah, so she had a real location she still has on Merriman Avenue. Um, and um, she she called us, I think, four months in, five months in. Uh, she went through the Christmas season just being retail and kind of wanted to stay just retail. It was kind of dipping her toe in the wholesale world. But one of the things that Ginger identified pretty early on was that if she was going to go wholesale, she just didn't have an interest in being in the grocery stores because she recognized that her product was more gourmet and she wasn't going to be willing to not use non-GMO popcorn, all natural ingredients. Um, She wasn't going to sacrifice the quality of her product to be able to be in an Ingalls or... um, Harris Teeter grocery store chains. And so uh, she, her experience and her background was in the gift market. And she knew that there was this untapped potential to grow her business through um, gift markets and boutiques and bed and breakfasts and things like that. And so it was like one of those perfect situations at the beginning because she gave us just enough directive to help us down a road, but not enough that like dictated the process. And so she was basically like, I want it, it to be appropriate for the gift market. And I want poppies to feel like a party. I just want it to feel like a party favor. And so that's kind of what started the first bags that you guys see at the top of our shelves. Um, And that the first iteration had actually that top part was a giant label, which her production team um, 
did not love me very much because putting a label on that big and putting it on straight and without air bubbles is quite the talent and the art. And I guess that's one thing. Um, packaging, we lo- I love packaging design because I actually love the problem solving that happens behind it. Most designers absolutely loathe packaging design because of the amount of time and research that you have to take to find your vendors to print your products and bags and whatever. And because your quantities and your clients' budgets may not align with where you want to print. Um, and then of course you think about how it has to be produced and the, the hands that are putting it together or the machines, like there's so many pieces. So designers are like, Nope, I don't really want to do that. And I like love all of those pieces. Um, and so to get to work with her on that and to basically introduce her into wholesale and to see with wholesale going from 75,000 to venture Asheville's, she was an entrepreneur of the year last year. And they even had, um, their roof collide in at their black mountain location, Uh, during Christmas time, their busiest time of year, and they still made more than what they anticipated making. Yeah, all the Black Mountain, like, not all of it, but, like, a lot of people showed up. The fire station showed up. The local furniture company showed up, and they, like, all made, like, a human line, and it was, like, handing bag to bag. It was, like, if you you had any, you know, views that people hated each other or, like, just wouldn't care for each other anymore and that we were all selfish and... Like that just like right there. It was like one of those like hallmark moments where you're like, wow, this is amazing to see how a community takes care of its own. Um, But yeah, she's the way that she's grown and the ability to do so much packaging for her has been great. It's been a really fun project um, to to be a part of that along for that ride. And that's what I think is just so cool. And what gets us out of the bed every day is that we get to work with people who can grow their business incrementally. They're letting us stay along with the ride. And, um, and also to be able to be like, wow, it's been 10 years and you can look around the city and you can see that the work that you've had the privilege of working on is actually like making a difference and changing the way that our city kind of looks. And that's super fun and cool. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to doing more of that. So here, here. And I just, I love that her name was Ginger after talking about Ginger's I know, rebel. I know. Can I, can I <laughs> so you, confusing. Around the office, it's still, because like we'll all go, so this thing for Ginger, and we all have to clarify, we have to be like Ginger's Revenge Poppy or Ginger. Ginger's. And what what's really uh, hilarious about that too is they, they both support each other and they have, um, so uh, Christina Hall, who, who owns Ginger's Revenge, she orders popcorn from poppies and so they also like work together so oftentimes they're talking about like the order there it gets really confusing but I guess that is something that has been really fun too is not only have we been able to help so many different businesses in town we've been able to grow a community that can inter refer and Mm. we've been doing that from the beginning too is if we have an insurance client and we know that they do a great job we let our other clients know I just got to give Miles's information from form and function architecture to um, to a new restaurant opening up in town that needs an architect. You know, you get to dynamite the, one of my favorite poppies, popcorn, poppy popcorn flavors is their dynamite flavor, um, of popcorn. And they've got dynamite coffee, like the popcorn's rolled in dynamite coffee. It's so good. Um, and that collaboration was such a fun introduction to make. So, um, that's been neat too. And Mm. one of the, the neat things about Asheville. My mouth is watering. We're going to have to go out and buy yeah, that popcorn right away. I would say it's so funny. It. When people yeah. come in, they're like, hey, is the popcorn? Is there popcorn in there? I'm like, I would love to offer you a snack of popcorn right now, but I can tell you it's packing peanuts in there because yeah. otherwise we wouldn't have the self-control yeah. to have that, that on the shelf. So, smart, yeah. so um, got if you want some, peanuts. I think Duncan and York or the Moonlight Makers down yeah. the street has curious poppies yeah. if you want to go get some. We, pa- we pass by poppies all the time, actually, at Merriman because we're very close. We live quite close to there. So oh, nice. We have to pop in and stock up for the holidays didn't didn't we pop in that's fun um didn't oh. we gave poppy as a wedding favor we did we gave the actual uh, mix as our wedding favor that's great. and like we'd never had it before and then like we ate it and that was the first time we just moved down yeah. so yeah. anyways we yeah, ate it and we were, here, I like yeah. ate it in one setting like ate the entire like the day after yeah our that's dangerous there. with poppy <laughs> yeah with yeah. with the popcorn for yeah. sure um and that i mean that was fun too because yeah i yeah, it, it's just it's been fun to see to see her grow the holiday season. Mm-hmm. If you haven't tried their gingerbread flavor, I would I would recommend that. That's our favorite from their holiday favors. Wow. So. Yeah. So I mean, uh, a thank you for all of like a, a walk down memory lane. We're excited for your future. Um, I have no doubt that you're going to keep ripping the cover off of the metaphorical ball. 
Um, but would love to know a little bit more about you both and like Asheville and community in Asheville specifically. I'm wondering when you think about uh, the community maybe of clients or just here in Asheville, those two words together, what shows up Asheville and community? Um, oh gosh. Well, I really love, I am trying to bring the group together, but I meet with a lot of female, uh, younger female entrepreneurs, younger than myself as I am not saying that I'm necessarily old. It's just, it's been funny. Like I, I have people I meet with off and on It'd be fun to bring that together as a group where we can kind of do some goal planning together, um, where everyone kind of can meet each other and it's not isolated incidences. So, I mean, there's well, they a community have to be business owners. They can be co-owners too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 For yeah. sure. So we have, um, so we have, you know, that kind of thing I have going on. Um, we have, um, just a great group of people that own restaurants that we hang out with breweries, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of fun. I actually love going out into town, doing grocery shopping, and running into two or three people. Dean, at this point, knows that if I say I'm going to go somewhere and then I'll be home in 30 minutes, he knows that's an hour and a half because I'll run into somebody. And that's what I think is really cool is to be able to go out there. And that community is where you go. Um, we used to take walks during our lunchtime um, around downtown, and we had to kind of stop doing that because we were doing it for exercise, but it wasn't exercise because it became networking events because you'd <laughs> run into clients as you walked or friends and it became like okay this is not cardio this is not any kind of cardio at all so this is kind of dumb to be doing it from that standpoint for for that standpoint um but um but yeah so i think that it's um we just enjoy that about this and that there's one degree of separation and um and everyone that we get to kind of experience uh with community what would you say i mean you still play music that about covers it yeah we put your questions for us on um the our thing and some one of the, I guess, bands that, that follows us or whatever was asking what Dean's favorite, uh, or just asking what our favorite shoegaze uh, genre of music was. Or band. Yeah. yeah. Shoegaze is a genre. <laughs> yeah, and Dean's like, hmm, maybe I should like message them back and ask if they need a bass player. <laughs> so, so, um, so, yeah, so I think that that's kind of where, we're, there's not a shortage of people that we enjoy hanging out with in this yeah. town, that's yeah. for sure. What about restaurants or things to do in town? I know that there's can be a lot of clients so on this list. I know, I had to make a list because I was like, dang, if we leave a client off this or if it yeah. becomes, but we'll we'll be true. We'll 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 just yeah, tap the client. Hip. Yeah, from the hip. Uh, so coffee for us is often a balance between high five and trade and lore. Yeah. Um, one of the restaurants that hasn't been mentioned that we really love, and I don't, I think people it's just not top of mind because it's not right in Asheville, is Stony Knob Cafe. Hmm. Um, they are uh, like kind of right at the beginning of Weaverville. Um, and it's a Mediterranean, they're on their second generation. It's two brothers that own it, man. They've got some great food. Their brunch is outstanding. Their dinner is really good, but what's really cool and what's fun to take people to is just their space has been, it was the original diner that I guess yeah, it used to be started. just a diner in like the nineties. I remember going to, and they've added onto it. And so they have oh. like, I kind of call it the, the Fred Flintstone, like the lodge, lodge room. They've got like paintings of like wonder woman on the wall and um, james bond Betty page um and like it's just very fun and eclectic and kind of postmodern. but most of their client base is is older gen xer and baby boomer and mm -hmm. it's like hardly anybody our age and younger knows about the place or if they do i think there's they i don't know there's just it's just weird that 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 place doesn't get the attention that it should mm -hmm. get so Maybe they're listening right now. We're giving you a shout yeah. out. Stony Knob. What's up, <laughs> Stony Knob? We're going to come check you out soon. Yeah. I. Um, so, I mean, we do, we eat a lot at All Day Darling just because it's part of our routine and going back and it's forth. So we do, so we do really love to support our clients um, and go to their kind of establishments. Pasana, um, for sure. Yeah, Pasana yeah, we always like to tell people if they have not been at Pasana to try the brunch first to, to start out and then and then go to dinner and, and things like that afterwards. Um, Lamone's is a great one. I mean, that's just really great. And then um, I love seeing all the different shops that open up here and how local. It's very rare, I think, in some of the cities I've been in to have like locally owned shops in such a great little walking foot area. Um, you know, just thinking about going to Charleston and trying to find a lot of those shops, I had to like not just walk, but also drive to a couple of them. You don't have to really do that here. And so um, our friend Martha owns Mora uh, Jewelry on Walnut. It's right by um, the Five Walnut Wine Bar. I'm probably not saying their name totally yeah, right. right. That's it. Um, 
And yeah, uh, oh yeah, Mountain Madre has been. Well, it's next oh yeah, to it's right Madre. there. That's I actually really enjoy um, their Mexican food. But um, yeah, the Big Crafty, which is actually this weekend, which um, that's been a neat thing to go to and to take people to. Um, depending on visitors, we also like to go to um, the Folk Art Center, which is the Southern Highland Craft Guild. Um, on one, because you get to drive the Blue Ridge Parkway a little bit, and two, because that building is just pretty cool. cool. And you can, if you guys haven't tried that out yet, it's worth going and seeing all of the um, kind of regional crafts that they have there um, that are made. Um, and um, and then. I love doing kind of like the art run. So Lexington Glassworks is really fun, especially on demo days, um, taking people to that. Um, and of course, doing some of the brewery what's, scenes. What's the name of that restaurant we like in Swannanoa that I, I'm blanking? Native? It. Native, yeah. East Asheville does not have enough restaurants. I think that's one thing that yeah. has been kind of is a bummer about So Asheville. if you're trying to open a restaurant, open one in East Asheville. Trying to find some real estate in East, East Asheville. That's where we um, live. We also spend probably too much time at a place called Mr. K's. It's a used bookstore. We've heard, it comes up all the time. Not on, not on the podcast yet, I don't think, but Mr. K's. Mr. K's has just a plethora of books. Of everything. Comics, wow. cookbooks, business books, CDs, movies. CDs, vinyl. Yeah, it's um, you can just. It's spend like, like it's two over like the Home, Home Depot kind of East Asheville. Time. Yeah, it's in the River Ridge shopping complex. Got it. it used to. The, the crazy yeah, thing is, is I used to work at Eckerd Drugs that used to be in that space. So it's 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 interesting going to where I used to work for five years and <laughs> mm-hmm. going there to get you know get things I like like CDs and um, you know and books and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So it's it's a great place to go um, there. I don't think the ownership is here in town. I think they actually. Um, a couple, there are a couple more stores. I think there's, they're out of Tennessee, but, oh, wow. but definitely ask them if they'd be interested in talking. So. Yeah. They, I mean, everyone, cause we will go, we typically try and buy used books when we, when we can, like if it's something that we know that we want, we try yeah. and find it after someone's read it. Um, and every time we stop into places and they don't have something that I'm like specifically asking for, they're like, have you been to Mr. K's? You should check out Mr. K's. It's mm-hmm. three or four times now. So this yeah, is number yeah, four, but on lot. the radio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The radio. Yeah. But only the last two places that kind of come to mind is um, Harvest Records. I actually went to college with those guys oh, that cool. started that. Um, they'd be a fun group to talk to because they've really fundamentally helped to shape the music scene here in town. There was already a really strong music scene, but when they moved here with pretty much right after college to start Harvest, um, they are really cool guys. Um, and then uh, Wist, kind of right across the street, mm. which is the like the, one of the most fun gift stores you could possibly shop in. Um, I love all of their cards and stationery and geek out about some of the illustrations and things that they have in there. So, but yeah, I think that's it for me. That's a great list. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Mm-hmm. Oh, Heyday Music. <laughs> oh, yeah. On Lexington. Great What's guys. Hayden? Brian Landry. Heyday. 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 Like music holiday. from the Heyday. Did Holiday mention and that in his? He didn't explicitly, but he he's... He was very into music, and I was wondering if you ever play with Holiday. He, he we haven't. We've talked about it. Okay. But We've tried. N- yeah, he's he recently been, brought yeah. the guitar back into his uh, studio, mm-hmm. which I'm excited. I've never, I've never actually listened to his, his music yet. That's something that I need to correct for. Yeah. But it, how about to listen to music in town that's not on a CD or vinyl? Do you guys find yourself going out to shows? I mean, obviously, the orange peel. If it's um, a, we tend it's a to thing. go to when we go to shows. It tends to be bands that are not necessarily from this area. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't really know a lot of local, you know, other than Angel Olsen, who's not, who's pretty much national. Um, I, I, you know, it's yeah. embarrassing, and I'm kind of ashamed of that. But <laughs> I don't. Okay. I haven't kept up with the local music scene as well as I could. But yeah, I mean, we were just we just saw Wild Nothing at the Great Eagle, which mm-hmm. was a really great show. Um, what was the last show you just saw at the Orchard? Ride, a shoegaze band. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Got the shoegaze in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, just enjoying the local venues for... We get some great yeah. like national talent here. And, and sure. just to be explicit, in case anyone is <laughs> trying to understand the word, it's shoegaze, which is looking, gazing at your shoes. <laughs> shoegaze not a word that you haven't heard two words just next to each other that are fun cool <laughs> shoegaze great music because they're looking at their effects pedals <laughs> <laughs> genre period of music I lo- oh, love it's it back. 
We do, there's we one more question. Well, there's, I guess, two questions, so they're pretty brief. Um, one is the magic wand question, which we didn't ask, <laughs> which is if we had a magic wand or someone in our audience had a magic wand, what would you ask for? Um, I feel like I probably said, I think that if we could have more professional service office space in this town mm-hmm. for people that need, uh, you know, right below 2000 square feet and it wasn't $38 a square foot, like there needs to be just like our city is trying as our city rapidly grows is trying to, to figure out ways to do, to try to have affordable housing. It'd be great to be able to have some more affordable office space for growing businesses that isn't totally um co-working or a lot of the spaces are like 3,000 square feet or more and you mm. just don't need quite that much space right. so mm. i would say that might be what i would ask for which isn't something that people can probably give but you never know you never know we so. support that okay. heard as we look for an office space in 2020 <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> we support and, we, that. and i would only add to that i agree with her and just a place that we can bring our dog to work Oh yeah, we can't bring mm. we can't bring Luna to work with us here, but that's Luna, okay. Cute name, and then the last question. I do believe that this is it. Is how do people find you on the internet? Yeah, so I mean, our website is atlasbranding.com. dot um, Our handle for most of our social media we're prim- primarily on Instagram, and at this point, we just kind of repost to Facebook. But it's Atlas Branding. Um, we do a lot of Pinterest too. It's mm. mostly just because. Um, it, it's one of the many places we look for inspiration, but yeah, just Atlas branding would be our handle and everything and else. And Instagram when we have time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's delegation and help having someone probably help us with that in 2020. So here, 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 here. Well, thank you again. Thanks you guys yeah. for um, taking the time to, it, to meet with us and to ask us these questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it was absolutely. most certainly our privilege and our pleasure uh, we'll do this again after 2020 and find out what all craziness has happened in the expansion. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> sounds Might great. need more than a year. <laughs> no, you guys, will, you guys will already have taken no, over. No, it'll, it'll take some time. It'll, you know, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. So that was episode 40 with Lisa and Dean Petit of Atlas Branding. Oh, man. man. <laughs> oh man just like uh, uh, so much inspiration for me specifically in that episode it, how can we not see ourselves you know future casted through that conversation it would be a dream that we're able to make it uh in Asheville 10 years grow a business consistently become like th- uh, I'll say it, the big dog on the block. They are uh, the realest deal doing uh, national level, global level quality of work. And they're, you know, just right down the street, right in downtown Asheville. It's crazy to think um, that that all exists here and that we can do it. If they can do it, we can do it. It's just going to take a lot of work. Yeah, we, we hope that um, no matter if you're a designer uh, or if you just have uh, your own business in a totally different industry that you found some helpful advice in this episode. We definitely did. And mm. we look up to both Lisa and Dean as um, role models for ourselves in the future. Um, so if there's something that you want to learn more about from this episode, la- there were a lot of books that we mentioned. There were a lot of the clients that we mentioned that Alice has worked with um, people, places, things, all that uh, you can visit. You can learn more about all that on the show notes page at making it in com forward slash zero four zero, which is the episode number after making it in Uh We have tons of links there, tons of information, backstory, mm-hmm. things you can learn more about the episode. Yep. And uh, we want to take a moment uh, while you're still paying attention, don't leave, to let you know (laughs) about (laughs) some of the events that we have planned and that are upcoming. Uh, The first event is going to be our uh, very first workshop here in Asheville. We are running a podcasting, beginner's podcasting workshop called Podcasting 101. Um, going to be very hands-on. We're going to go from podcasting theory and strategy as a, as a platform into very tactical, you know, how do you make edits in an audio file? Um, this is perfect for anyone, uh, full stop. You can be a sound engineer. We'll talk strategy with you. You can be a marketer. We'll talk, uh, technology with you. Um, but anyone who's interested in starting a podcast in 2020, the key outcome that we're pushing for is that you'll have um, episodes recorded moments after our interview because all of your questions will be answered. You'll know exactly what to do. There will be no barriers left other than to go. 
Yeah. And at the time that this podcast is coming out, I think we only have like two spots left in the workshop. So definitely make sure that you get on there um, as soon as you can. The price will go up, I think, starting February 1st. So get in there early, get your early bird uh, registration and it'll save money. And to be clear, if it if it uh, oversells, join the wait list. Let us know that you're interested. We could there's a bunch of ways that we can make the class either bigger or run another uh, class. You just need to let us know if you're interested and you can do that either by, you know, signing up, emailing us or joining the wait list. Should it sell out? Absolutely. And uh, another event that will be coming up and we still have to confirm some of the details, but we'll have another Monday maker mixer towards the end of February. Um, If you want to be the first to know about that, please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, You can do that, that, making it a nashville.com forward slash subscribe um, and you'll be the first to hear about the next event the last one we had had so many people sign up we were so so excited yeah. um, so we're looking forward to another successful monday maker mixer heard and uh, just a final plug for our business the business that makes this podcast possible making it creative Uh, If you are a small business in Asheville area or somehow or another listening to this and not in the Asheville area and you think that you could benefit from having a conversation around how to clarify your message and communicate more powerfully to your customers and and maybe charge more and maybe work a little less or find a uh, more seamless balance. We'd love to have a conversation with you. And so you can um, reach out to us about business things at makingitcreative.com. Um, there's a, some pretty clear calls to action on that site. Uh, but we look forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. And if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the podcast, we are always looking for new people to interview. Um, just visit makingitinashville.com forward slash podcast and fill out the nomination form there. Uh, we will review your nomination and hopefully get back to you soon. Yeah, well, I mean, we definitely we reach out to everyone that uh, that creates yep. and or for fills out that form. Um, and we are working through, uh, all of the great connections. One of the best things you can do in addition to filling out one of those podcasting, uh, forms is come to our events. Like one of the reasons, um, that we have that form is that it's more than just having a conversation with someone. We want to build a relationship. Um, and so before anyone is ever on our podcast, we're sitting down with them. We're having coffee. We're having a cocktail. We're, Uh, getting to know them so that hopefully the uh, relationship you hear in the episode feels comfortable, feels relaxed, and therefore we might get more meaningful, um, I guess, nuggets from the episode itself. So please reach out on makingitinashville.com forward slash podcast. 40 episodes in, Sarah. Can can you believe it? We, We forgot one thing. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Very Uh important thing. So if you want to know about all the latest episodes that come out, you want to know about events, be the first to hear about them and so on. uh, Please visit makingitinashville.com forward slash subscribe. There are tons of ways that you can subscribe to making it in Asheville on YouTube uh, via your favorite podcast player or our newsletter, which is where we share a lot of behind the scenes Mm -hmm. stories from each episode. And again, you're the first to hear about certain events and so on. A really cool thing that's starting to happen on our email list is like we, we take a lot of care in trying to announce and tell stories that you don't necessarily hear in the podcast through our email list. Um, and for the last several episodes, people have emailed us to say like, wow, that was a, that was a really good like bonus. Um, and that means a lot because we are, we're trying to make, each individual platform in its own way have its own special relationship. So if you like the podcast, you'll probably like our emails. If you are into the couple minutes on YouTube that we record in video, you'll probably like you know to subscribe to our podcast or come to our events. Um, all that to say, uh, thank you for being here today. If you enjoy it, please subscribe in whichever way is most meaningful to you. Right on. Now can I say, wow, 40 episodes? Yes. Wow, 40 <laughs> episodes in. I would never believe it. I can't, like, that means that we're super close to 52 episodes, and you know what happens when we hit 52? Yeah, that will be one year of A, living in Asheville, 
and be one year of recording this podcast, releasing an episode every single week. Crazy. So um, thank you for being here, uh, listener. We look forward to seeing you next week and maybe at the next Monday Makers. Be good, Sarah. Bye -bye. Did we take uh, you to 11? We went, this one goes to 11. <laughs> <laughs>